the truth is out there. At least that's the tagline for that famous TV show. You're supposed to look past the smoke screens, filter the disinformation, and shift through the bullshit. Then you will know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Hate to break it to you, but John 832 was a lie. The truth will clamp you down and chain you to a burden heavier than Hitler's guilt. I've had my own little glimpse of the truth. A tiny peak pieced together from three events over a period of ten years. That was more than enough to make me want to blow my brains out. I've got a Beretta 92 in my lap right now. And there's a high chance I'll use it by the end of the week. Remember that answers you seek might not be the answers you get. It started with a raid ten years ago. A SWAT raid to nab a vicious meth dealer. Fuck that raid. Look alive, ladies. Jones motioned for the rest of us to get into position. I'm right behind Brown, who's at the top of the stack. Hernandez snorts from behind me. Haynes takes up position near the lock, door ram in hand. The vapid beige of the McMansion in front of us makes me want to puke. We nab this meth dealer and we'll be the heroes of the week. No rookie screw-ups. Jones holds up three fingers to begin the countdown. Remember, the fucker's armed and dangerous, and terrified of prison showers. You see him, you take him down. Same goes for his thugs. Three? We're here because some anonymous tipper pointed us to this McMansion in Hallbrook. Tipper said we'd find Juice. Juan Juice Costello. Meth dealer extraordinaire and human chop shop all rolled into one bloody package. His crew's responsible for more murders and rapes this year than anyone else. No one's been able to pin anything on the slippery bastard. The few times we find witnesses, they conveniently forget what happened. If they're still alive. Brass must be sweating to nab Juice if they're sending in the cavalry based on an anonymous tip and nothing more. Then again... With the city elections coming up, it makes a cynical sort of sense. Two. I hold my MP5 loosely and start breathing deeply to ease up on the adrenaline. Once that hits, you get tunnel vision and start shaking so bad you have a hard time hitting anything in front of you. Smooth and steady fires first. Smooth and steady don't get nursed. Cheesy, but I've been chanting that ever since my first raid. Jones told it to me. Helps keep me focused. One. Haynes jerks the door ram back and plants his feet firmly on the welcome mat. Jones' eyes crackle with an energy that screams, I love this shit. Hernandez touches the crucifix inside his pocket and whispers a prayer to himself. And Brown double checks his silencer, glances back to me and nods. I squeeze his shoulder. It's go time. Police, open up. Jones booms like thunder. He always had a loud voice. Haynes smashes the door wide open. I pull the pin to an M84 flashbang and lob it through the door. There's a loud pop. Brown jumps forward with me right behind him. Hernandez, Haynes, and Jones pull up the rear. We all move quickly past the door. Doors are kill zones. Getting caught in a doorway is a rookie screw-up. Brown takes a hard right inside the front door while I come up behind to cover Brown. The foyer is empty, stairway on leading to the second floor on the right. Brown plants himself at the base of the stairs. There are two archways in the foyer, one leading to the living room on the left, and the other in front of us leading to the dining room. A half-second pause, and I move swiftly through the left arch into the living room. Hernandez behind me. Movement. Someone dives between a brown leather couch, head and arms peeking out from behind the couch, gloved hands holding a Glock 17 pointed in my general direction. Before Hernandez can shout, drop your weapon, I squeeze off two shots right through the couch. My MP5 cracks, spitting two bullets through the couch. There's a cough, and the Glock 17 pointed at me clatters onto the hardwood floor. Hiding behind a couch, amateur. Hands where I can see him, asshole. Hernandez shouts at the second guy, kneeling behind the couch. 
gloved hands and a suit just like the first. Unlike the first, this guy wasn't as quick on the uptake. His hands are still at his side. Drop the gun. Drop the fucking gun. Hernandez shouts louder. The guy's frozen stiff. Probably his first rodeo show. I hate these guys. The guy's eyes twinkle as he makes a split-second decision. His face contorts into a look that practically gives Hernandez the middle finger. Movement. Before the bastard can even touch his pistol, there are four pops. Four bullets from Hernandez and me. One bullet catches the dirt bag in the chest and another in the neck. The other two shatter the flat screen TV behind him. Another sack of piss down. I sweep my weapon around my area of responsibility. Hernandez does the same. Living room clear. Hernandez, on me. I motion towards the dining room and hear Jones on the other side. Kitchen clear. Dining room clear. Jones and Hernandez return from the kitchen and we reconvene in the foyer. Brown's still covering the stairs. Hey boss, you see any plastic containers or reinforced fans? Hernandez asks. I was wondering the same thing. You usually see those things in and around drug labs and houses. I was wondering where the extractor fans were. Shut up, Hernandez, and focus. Jones shoots Hernandez a dirty look. Something must be bothering Hernandez big time if he's willing to bring it up to Jones in the middle of a raid. Unworthy pigs! Someone shouts from somewhere upstairs. I run towards Brown just in time to see him squeeze off three shots. Up the stairs, another guy with a suit and gloves crumples to the floor, forehead crunching sickeningly off the top of the hardwood stairs. Brown, keep covering the stairs. Rest of you, on me. Jones motioned for us to head behind the stairs. A hallway snuggled in right behind and perpendicular to the stairs. One long kill zone with a doorway at the very end, and another near us on the right. Haynes and Hernandez smash through the first door on the right. Jones and I waste no time running up to the door at the end. I hear Hernandez call out, clear, just as Jones and I get to the door. I shoot my leg out and kick the white door open. A metal rod flashes and catches me across the helmet. There's an explosion of color, and I hit the floor. Two shots ring out. There's an explosion of splinters and dust to my left as two bullets smash to the left of the doorframe. I hear a ricochet and then a howl of pain. You can always count on Jones. He bursts into the room and stands over me. His MP5 still points at the asshole who clobbered me. Cheap shot. The guy's lying on his side, clutching at his knee with his left hand. Somehow, the bastard is still holding a pistol in his right hand. The crowbar is on the floor next to him. Drop the gun. Jones is yelling louder than he usually does. Seeing me crumple like that probably rattled him. He'd never admit to it, though. The guy's eyes are wide open, and he's shaking like he just went skinny dipping in ice water. He's breathing hard, and his eyes scream, suicide by cop. Worst of all, he refuses to drop the damn gun. Before I can react, Jones fires two shots. They hit him, ripping through the bastard's head and shoulders. There's a dull clunk as one bullet ricochets off the wall before hitting the floor. The guy goes still. Bedroom clear. Jones shouts just as Hernandez pops his head through the doorway, frowning. Hmm, I haven't seen any chemical waste lying around. Hernandez wonders out loud. Jones glowers at Hernandez. Move your ass upstairs, Hernandez, and shut the hell up. Back at Brown's position at the base of the stairs, Jones gives the signal. We shuffle quickly up the stairs, boots echoing throughout the hallway. The second story floor opens up to the left and right. On the left are two brown doors leading to a single room. On the right, there's a small hallway with a door on the right and another at the end of the hall. Hernandez, Haynes, get left. Parker, you and me will take this first door on the right. And Brown, cover the door at the end of the hall there. I could hear Hernandez and Haynes breaching their door just as Jones kicks the door to our room down. We burst into the room and nearly start shooting. The room is filled with people. Young and old, male and female, all haggard and scrawny. They look... used. All of them are lying face down, bound and gagged. Jones begins to voice his thoughts. Mother of... Boss, we got a situation here. Hernandez calls from his room. Busy here, Haynes. We got ourselves a room filled with people, sir. 
Alive? Affirmative. Shit just got real. None of the people on the floor seemed to notice us. They didn't squirm or move much, but they were breathing. Parker, get Hernandez. Secure that last room. I nod and rush out the door, grab Hernandez and begin approaching the end of the hall. I nodded to Hernandez, then kicked the door open and rushed in, weapons ready and Haynes covering me. The room's empty. There's a large bookshelf filled with books at the far end of the room. Next to that, a wooden desk completely free of debris. Apart from those things, the room is the definition of bare and boring. No wall decorations, brown hardwood flooring, and absolutely no sign of juice anywhere. Last room clear, I yell out to the others. Hernandez says nothing, but he narrows his eyes as he scans the room. He looks up to me like he wants to say something, but decides to keep his mouth shut for once. Both of us reconvene with the others. There's a slight buzz in the air, a tension we can all feel. Hernandez is the first to voice our concerns. I didn't know Juice was a trafficker, too. Jones just frowned. He clearly doesn't understand, either. We all hear the rest of the officers moving around downstairs, probably securing evidence and bodies. I'll get in touch with command. Do something about these people. Brown and Haynes each got off to one of the rooms to inspect the victims. Hernandez heads back towards the bare room at the end of the short hall and motions for me to follow. I can see the gears in his head spinning. Hernandez's hunches usually lead somewhere, so I let him do his thing while I stand guard. Hernandez walks up to the bookcase, turns back and looks at the desk. He knocks a few times and brings his ear to the wall while giving another again. At this point, I'm wondering if this is all a show. Hernandez loves big reveals. Fíjate. I practically jump at the words. I scan the area, still unsure what he's found. You don't see it, Parker? Hernandez begins pounding on the wall, and then rips the bookcase away to reveal a small, closet-sized space. On the left of the space, there are stairs leading down into darkness. On me, Parker. Now we get to be heroes. Hernandez grins wickedly. Going without more backup was stupid, but curiosity is one of my weaknesses. I turn on my flashlight and follow Hernandez into the darkness. We continue down, down, down. As we go down, the walls change from cement, wood, and sheetrock to stone. Was this house built on caves? Hernandez practically read my mind. The caves, huh? Would make it easy for human trafficking cabronas, right? Hernandez looks back at me as he speaks. I simply nod my head. We begin walking a bit faster. The underground passage was still too narrow with no cover. The worst kind of kill zone. Hernandez and I walk through the darkness for a few seconds before the cave finally opens to reveal a cavern about 15 feet high. You see that, Parker? Hernandez points his MP5 in the direction of what looks like a couple of rocks piled on top of each other. I nod as we approach. Don't get too excited, Hernandez. The place isn't secure yet. The rock formation doesn't look natural, more like someone shaped them, cut them into illogical shapes, a rounded slab of stone resting on top of the pile, with the edges curling up like a shallow bowl. Rough, obscene sculptures decorate the outer border of the bowl-shaped slab. Dark brown splotches stain the middle of the bowl. Hernandez points to an unfamiliar symbol carved around the outside of the rock formation. It looks like some kind of a cult symbol. Hernandez tries to hide it, but I see him whisper a prayer and cross himself. I don't recognize the symbol. It looks like a vertical football with three curved triangles two on the left and the third on the right. All three triangles point to the center of the vertical football. I flash the light around and see something stained or painted above the altar. It looks like words, but I don't recognize the language. As I stare at the words, they suddenly start shifting and merging into something readable. Prove thyself worthy unto Yothabra. Hernandez moves around to the other side of the altar as I step back. Occult ritual shit isn't my scene. Shivers sprout at the nape of my neck and crawl down my back. I feel like I'm in someone's crosshairs. 
Hernandez takes a step back, and I hear a soft click. Hernandez, get... A flash of blinding white lights up the room as a wall of force slams into me and rips me off my feet. I fall into a black pool with no bottom, where the inscription on the cavern ceiling sears itself into my mind. The next few memories are a blur. I remember being on a stretcher and then a hospital. They told me I was lucky. A couple of cuts and bruises and some broken bones, but nothing serious. The only thing that worried me was the concussion, apparently. My head hit the ground hard. I was found with my head right next to a small, yet sharp rock, just a couple inches more to the left. Hernandez wasn't so lucky. Pieces of him were found, but not much else. Jones unleashed an arsenal of insults once I woke up in the hospital. We were dumb as shit. We should have waited for backup. We completely disregarded protocol. The whole nine yards. He wasn't wrong. They never found juice or anything connected to him. As far as I know, the house had nothing to do with drugs or juice. The anonymous tipper. Nothing. Just gone. Hell, later I did some independent investigation and no one could even tell me who actually signed off on the raid. I tried following the paper trail, but it just led in a big circle. Eventually, the higher-ups demanded... In no uncertain terms, I leave things alone and stop drawing attention to the shit show of a raid. Brass played up the rescue of oh so many people to distract from the entire debacle. To be fair, it worked. The media forgot to ask questions about the shadier details when we showed everyone the gaunt faces and haggard physiques of the people we rescued. At least the ones that didn't die. As if things weren't bizarre enough, from what I hear, a good number of the hostages, or whatever they were, killed themselves. One girl smashed her head into the cement driveway as she was being walked out of the mansion. Another woman tumbled head over heels over the railing on the second floor and hit the edge of the wooden stairs head first. That one definitely left a mess. Others just keeled over and died. I somehow managed to piece together the timing of it all. All those haggard prisoners died or killed themselves right around the same time Hernandez triggered the booby trap and blew that cavern to kingdom come. So the husband points a gun at his wife's head, and you know what she says. Jones eyes me with wide, almost disbelieving eyes. Uh, their safe word? I shrugged. Jones didn't even hear it. She says, and I shit you not, I am worthy. And then she just stares at him, waiting for him to pull the trigger. Doesn't cry, scream, or try to stop him. He snorted at the last bit. Jones was sitting on a couch across from me in my living room. It was about four years since I quit the force. That shit show of a raid just got to me. The weird altar we found and the nightmares I had afterwards didn't help either. I went into private investigation to forget about it all. I did a terrible job of keeping up with the guys. As they say, when you leave the force, you leave the tribe. I guess Hubby's not too pleased. I sink back into the couch after pouring Jones another scotch. He just pulls the trigger and blasts a hole right through his wife's eye. Jones downs another shot of scotch. We find the bastard crying over her body. He slams the shot glass down. Jones didn't come just to talk. He was angling for something. So, what's this got to do with me? Jones looked up at me after pouring himself one last shot. Well, uh, we arrested the guy and booked him. Guy waves all rights and admits to everything. Doesn't even try to defend himself. So he makes your job easier for once. How's that my problem? The day he's up for arraignment, Hubby just keels over and dies. Right in front of some rookie. Bingo. Let me guess. You're curious about the death. Still wondering why he did it, but Brass locked the case down tighter than Fort Knox. Am I close? Jones grinned white teeth shining right through. Sharp as ever. 
Are you and the rest of the boys going to pay me for my time on this one? Uh, we figured you'd want to do this one out of curiosity. I arched an eyebrow but waited for Jones to continue. Call it a hunch. Jones smiled a very cryptic smile. I made a show of stroking the stubble on my chin. Not good enough. Sorry. I looked away, trying to look uninterested. Jones leaned back, eyes narrowed. Does the phrase prove thy worth mean anything to you? Despite my best efforts, my jaw dropped. Ah, I figured that'd pique your interest. Jones kept that cryptic smile of his. How did you know? You know those dreams where you're giving a speech in front of a bunch of people and suddenly realize you're naked? That's how I felt right now. Don't remember? You kept repeating it while you were out of it. When we pulled you out of the rubble, Jones stole a glance at his phone. It's getting late, Parker. Just think about it. I don't need an answer right this second. Jones pulled out a manila folder and plopped it onto the table in front of me. Of course, just like Jones to dangle a juicy piece of bait in front of me. Just read through these papers. According to the now dead husband, the wife repeated some interesting things to herself. If that don't pique your interest, then I'll get off your back and we can leave this buried. I'll think about it. Jones stood up and gulped down the rest of his drink. We exchanged goodbyes and he was out the door. Now alone, I turned back to stare at the folder lying on the table. A folder pregnant with mystery. I rubbed my forehead as I grabbed the folder and flipped it open. The first thing to greet me was a collection of photographs of the victim's corpse. I frowned. It was a while since I've seen this kind of thing. In one of the photos, the body was on its stomach. There was a tattoo on the small of her neck. A tattoo that looked like a vertical football with three curved triangles pointed towards the center. I was caught before I even realized it. I spent the rest of the night looking over the folder and digesting details. Looked like Jeff Coleman really did blow his wife away. According to the file, neighbors heard shouting and crying as if the couple was fighting. There was a loud gunshot and then just Jeff crying. Jeff himself called the cops. When they arrived, he surrendered. Hell, the guy pleaded guilty to everything. At no defense, uh, no nothing. The guy even waived his right to an attorney. Just, poof, I'm guilty. And that was it. After Jeff's admission, the investigation just stopped. To be fair, that made some sense. The suspect was caught and came clean. Why bother wasting time and personnel on an open and shut case? And then Jeff dies, apparently from grief in front of a cop. What else could be done? I can't say I'd do things differently. Jeff dying in custody didn't arouse any real suspicion. According to Jones, Jeff was distraught when they caught him, and distraught is putting it mildly, too. The guy wouldn't stop crying. In the cell the night of Jeff's arrest, they had to strap him down because he was banging his head against the concrete wall a little too hard. There was a blurb on one page of the notes. Jeff told the cops how Annie, his wife, kept repeating, Prove thyself worthy unto Euthabra, in the days and months before her death. Just like a prayer. The case certainly piqued my interest. Jones got that much right. I'd be investigating this case no matter what I got paid, or even if. Knowledge was a form of payment on its own. After the explosion out of this trafficker's house, the curiosity never stopped gnawing at me. The dead ends and complete lack of any leads just made me more determined to find out what happened. That and guilt. After all, I was still alive, and Hernandez wasn't. I was also single and Hernandez wasn't. Sitting with Hernandez's wife, Rosa, and telling her what happened had to have been the most difficult thing I've ever done. Their two-year-old son sat on Rosa's lap and kept asking where daddy was, 
while Rosa stared silently into space. She tried to hide it, but I knew she wished I had died, and not her husband. I couldn't blame her. It had been four years later, and I still had no leads, at least until Jones dropped a massive one right on my coffee table. A small frisson of hope tingled my insides. I knew I would eventually have to investigate Jeff and Annie's house, but first, I wanted some background info on Jeff. I flipped open my laptop and spent the night conducting a little research. Jeff was ex-army. Good. Ex-army types usually had a couple of people that would know them well. One of Jeff's army buddies was still in the area. It looked like both had kept in regular contact, and they only lived about ten minutes apart. How convenient. The next day, I found myself on Adam's front porch. After I told him I wanted to find out more about Jeff, Adam invited me to sit down on the porch while he pulled a couple of beers from the fridge. Jeff's biggest mistake was marrying that bitch. Adam frowned as he took a sip of his beer. Bad enough to shoot her through the head? Adam gave me a dirty look. Look, detective. Adam spat that word out like venom. You didn't fight by Jeff. I'd follow that bastard into hell if he wanted me to. No disrespect, or we're done here. I apologized. No sense in riling up Jeff's friend here. I cleared my throat before asking my next question. I'm just trying to get a picture of Jeff's and Annie's relationship. Can you paint me one? Adam settled into his chair and took a deep breath. His facial features twitched as he suppressed his anger. Annie just didn't appreciate Jeff. Guy goes off to fight for his country and makes sure she's taken care of. What does she do? She whores around behind his back. If you get tired of the guy, break it off. Don't open your legs behind his back like that. I wasn't aware of that. Who was the mystery me? I don't think even Jeff knew. But I'm sure the romance started before she and Jeff moved into that place on Boulder Street. What makes you think that? Jeff's problem was that he bent over backwards for Annie. He came over one day more than a year ago. Apparently, Annie developed a sudden urge to move into Boulder Street. The house didn't matter. It just had to be Boulder Street. Wouldn't stop nagging his ear off about it. Why did she want that? Adam narrowed his eyes at me. You figure it out, detective. Adam spat into the bush in front of him. Why the sudden urge to move to a specific street? Why the late night outings? Why the explosive bursts of anger any time Jeff has to see her phone? Jeff told you this? Jeff sat in your chair every weekend telling me the latest bullshit. Annie shoved it in his face. Every time I told him to divorce the witch or at least separate from her. But he just couldn't do it. The guy could run straight into gunfire but didn't have the balls to end it with Annie. Adam grew suddenly silent and his eyes hardened. He took another sip of his beer and stared into space. For a moment, I think he forgot about me. Why couldn't you just dump her ass, you bastard? With that trip to Pinecrest on the calendar, we, we could have... Adam took a deep breath. Burn in hell, you witch. Adam blinked, as he remembered he still had an audience. I hesitated, wondering if the time for questioning had passed. Was he acting any differently the couple of days before he shot her? I, I don't. Actually, he was. He came by a couple of days before. Sat in silence, mostly. Out of the blue, he asked me what I would do if... Doing the right thing meant everybody would think you're a monster. I asked what he meant. I, I don't know if he even heard me. Didn't even speak until he left. I wanted to do something. But how could you help someone who won't even help themselves? I remembered the tattoo I saw on Annie's back. Did Jeff find something out about that? I asked Adam, but he knew nothing about Annie's tattoo. I set the empty beer can down and thanked Adam for his time. 
Hey, P.I., you find Annie's paramour, come by and let me know. I got a couple of things I want to discuss with him. I told him I'd think about it and headed back to my car. Broken relationships are always worth mourning even when the husband was a murderer and the wife a total bitch. I thought about investigating tattoo parlors, but that was tedious, and I wasn't in the mood for tedious. It looked like Jeff and Annie's house was next. Jeff and Annie moved into Boulder Street a little more than a year ago. When I pulled up to the place, I wondered what went through Annie's head when she picked the place out. If anything, this place on Boulder Street was a downgrade from their last house. The deep brown paint was peeling and reminded me of those decaying houses you see in horror movies featuring redneck serial killers. The wind picked up and rustled what leaves were left of a gnarled oak sprouting out of the front yard. The tree looked like the tentacles of some underground monster who'd finally breached the surface. I again felt as if someone had me in their crosshairs. As I stepped onto the driveway of the house, an older man poked his bald head out of the front door of a neighboring house. He waddled up to meet me in a bathrobe and slippers. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, can I help you? I hate nosy people. You know the couple who lived here? I pointed to Jeff's and Annie's house. Uh, it sure do. It's sad what happened. Uh, very sad. Don't I know about it? I continued, walking towards the front door. Uh, are you a police officer? I stopped and turned back to the old man. Who's asking? Uh, just part of the neighborhood watch. Uh, make sure you're not about to do anything illegal. The bastard had balls. I'll give him that. The average person usually doesn't go for awkward confrontations, much less questioning a random stranger on a neighbor's property, the way this old fart did. I closed my mouth and started breathing through my nose to calm down. Didn't want to say or do anything I'd regret. Look, uh, Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner. I'm a private investigator. I'm just investigating the murder of Annie Mason. Wasn't her husband the one who killed her? Well, yes, but some relatives wanted closure and hired me to find out what exactly happened. The old fart began scratching his non-existent beard as if trying to show me how hard he was thinking. Interesting. I wasn't aware Annie or Jeff had any siblings. With Annie's parents dead and Jeff's on the other side of the country, I'm not sure who could have hired you. I felt my fists clench. This guy was just asking to get punched off his high horse. Maybe if I smashed that fat nose of his as well as knocked his teeth in. I dropped that train of thought. Look, asshole, I'm going to have a look around. I'm not doing anything illegal being here. But if you want to call the cops, be my fucking guest. Old Fart made a show of being taken aback by my terrible manners, but he assured me that the proper authorities would be notified. That wouldn't give me much time to investigate. I hate old nosy people. Once he went indoors to tattle on me, I walked down the driveway and opened the side door to Jeff's house. You'd be surprised how many people don't lock their side door. Inside, I found a very ordinary-looking home. I'd even say it was cozy. Everything seems to have a proper place. A wooden end table occupying what would have been an empty corner space. A painting of an ancient church covering a bare white wall. Nothing looked like it belonged to a couple with a broken relationship. There was even a cutesy picture of a heart with a list of the ingredients for a lasting marriage. <laughs> I wasted too much time looking for anything out of the ordinary. The thought that the cops would be here any minutes made me lose focus. I don't work well when rushed. I quickly scanned every room, upstairs and downstairs, but found nothing of interest. I was in the master bedroom on the second floor, rummaging through a red antique dresser, when I saw a squad car pull up in front of the house. Damn it. I ran into the hall and without thinking, I turned on the lights. I looked back and something caught my eye. 
an air vent on the left side of the hallway. I don't know what, but the way the lighting cast shadows on the air vent seemed off. I paused in front of the air vent and took a peek. Nothing but solid black. This wasn't an air vent, but some kind of secret compartment built into the wall and made to look like an air vent. Clever. I noticed the screws bolting the air vent covered to the wall, but I took a chance and pulled at the air vent. It came right out of my hands. I thought the screws had looked fake. I pulled the entire thing out. An auburn jewelry box the width of an iPad rested inside. It looked rustic and had worn corners. I pulled out the jewelry box along with some loose papers and shoved the air vent compartment back into the wall. The side door downstairs creaked open. James, you there? Shit, they were already in. I didn't bother with the papers and gently shut the fake air vent cover to the secret compartment. I stuffed the jewelry box inside my coat. Its weight felt awkward on my coat, but I managed to hide it. The two cops were downstairs. I called out that I was coming downstairs and walked down with my hands up. First Jones, and now Haynes and Brown. What a coincidence. It almost felt like the good old days. An old fart say I was trespassing or something? Brown cracked a smile. Yeah. He also said you threatened him when he confronted you. <laughs> Me, threaten. I didn't even pull out my gun. You know old people. My grandma used to freak every time the alarm she set went off. Brown chuckled. Look, guys. Jones gave me the case file. Said the guys were curious about this one. Both Brown and Hayes gave me knowing looks. The guy who blows away his wife and then kneels over and dies from the guilt? This is their house? I nodded. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Right, Haynes? Haynes ignored Brown and looked at me. Look, James, we go way back. Work the case all you want, but leave the neighbors out of it. That old bastard came on to me. Don't know what got his panties in a bunch. Hayes shrugged. Nothing we can do about it, James. I nodded and wished both of them a good day. No reason to antagonize old friends. I got back in my car and drove home. I imagined Mr. Gardner choking on his dentures or falling down and breaking a hip. That would have been nice. Once home, I grabbed a beer from the fridge and sat down on the couch with the antique jewelry box in front of me. The jewelry box was webbed in spidery ink patterns that looked like geometric shapes. The ink could have been real gold ink. There was no lock, just a metal clasp holding it together. Did any or Jeff think the box was too well hidden to bother with a lock? I felt my jaw clench as I undid the clasp and opened the box. A shudder rippled through my chest. There was nothing but teeth inside the box. Lots and lots of human teeth. And the smell of bleach. First, Annie has a tattoo of some kind of occult symbol, and now I find a jewelry box full of human teeth. I don't know why, but I started wondering if this is what made old Fart Gardner so interested in my trespassing. The rational side of me came up with a hundred reasons why this was a stretch, but it couldn't convince my gut to let this suspicion go. Is it possible you have a few skeletons in your closet, Mr. Gardner? A thought turned on the light bulb in my head. I went to the kitchen and grabbed a plastic bowl. I came back to the couch and dumped all the teeth into the box. The inside of the jewelry box was lined with some kind of silky fabric. I grabbed a knife and cut the fabric out. Bingo. That weird symbol staring right back at me. The same symbol tattooed on Annie's back. The same symbol carved on that occult altar underneath the McMansion we raided four years ago. A very familiar phrase was carved above the symbol. Prove thyself worthy unto Yothabra. What did Annie tell Jeff when he pointed a gun to her head? I am worthy. 
I began to see more connections than I wanted to. Connections that touched my spine like cold fingers and made my hair stand on end. What if Annie wasn't cheating on Jeff? What if there were other reasons she wanted to move to the house on Boulder Street, which just so happened to be next to Gardner's place? This cult could also explain those hostages or prisoners we caught in the raid, and those people we found. Could some of them have really believed? Is that why they killed themselves when Hernandez inadvertently destroyed their possible place of worship? How did Jeff fit into all of this? Did he really kneel over and die, or did someone help him? The questions and speculations kept coming. I thought about going to Jones with what I found, but something kept me from actually dialing his number. I still hadn't figured anything out. All I found was a jewelry box stuffed with human teeth. Creepy? Yes. Disgusting? Absolutely. But conclusive? Not quite. I figured I'd sit on this a bit longer. I really wanted to drop by Mr. Gardner's and have a chat. A crack in the night shook me out of my thoughts. I looked up and froze. Yes, I distinctly heard something. I then heard footsteps. I grabbed my Benelli M4 shotgun and turned out the lights. I may have turned in my badge, but I kept my guns. I crawled over to the window, nudging the curtain just enough to look through. Sure enough, there was a man standing out in front. He wore an expensive suit with black leather shoes. The moonless night kept his face in shadow as he stared at my house. He had one hand hanging protectively at his side. That was where he kept his weapon. I like facing my problems head on, so I unlocked my front door and threw it open. I raised my gun and made sure he could see it was pointed at his chest. The intruder started, but didn't reach for his weapon. Can I help you? I wasn't feeling very chatty. The man continued to stare at me in silence. From where I stood, I could see an exposed wrist, which happened to have a certain tattoo. If you got nothing to say, leave. I tried to keep myself from stuttering. It was a while since I had done this sort of thing. Luckily, the man in front of me didn't think I was joking, and I sure as hell wasn't. That seemed to open the man's mouth. You have questions, but I cannot provide answers. The man spoke calmly, almost as if he didn't care if he died that night. Then what are you doing on my lawn? Leave. I stepped closer, shotgun still pointed at him. I won't ask again. The man raised an eyebrow. I don't think the conversation was going in the direction he envisioned. The man turned as if to leave, but stopped. I have come to test the worthy. If you're going to talk, Cut the culty bullshit, because I'm really starting to lose patience. I motioned with my gun to really drive the point home. The man smiled a wide grin that practically reached his ears. Your own curiosity will stay your hand. This joker thinks I was bluffing. Like I think twice about killing some dirtbag who comes into my front lawn. In that split second, I lowered my gun just a degree and focused on something just past the man. Something inconsequential that probably saved my life. You might not realize it, but you react better to things just on the periphery of your vision. Staring directly at something actually slows down your reaction time. Out of my own peripheral vision, I saw the man shift his weight to brace for recoil. That was all it took. I pulled the trigger, thunder split the night, and the slug hit the bastard square in the chest. He fell to the ground, coughing. A handgun fell out of the man's coat and thumped onto the dirt next to him. Damn it. My only source of answers made me shoot him in the chest. If the situation wasn't so stupid, I'd laugh. I ran up to the dying, coughing man. He looked right into my eyes as he saw me. You. You are worthy. I didn't believe. His body was shaken by a violent spasm that cut off his words. 
The dying man's eyes managed to find mine for one last second. Yothobra. That was all the man could muster before succumbing to death. I stood there, trying to process what was happening, until I noticed police sirens in the distance. Somebody must have heard the gunshot. I sighed. This investigation was going to last all night, and, of course, I'd be taken into custody. I wanted to kick the dead guy's face in for delaying my investigation. I told the cops who arrested me it was self-defense. The guy dying on my front lawn lent some credence to my story. The dead guy being a total spook helped even more. No fingerprints, no dental records, no wallet. Even the tags on his clothing were removed. There was absolutely no way to identify him. Luckily, I wasn't charged with anything. I think the DA bought my story. I heard Jones got chewed out for coming to me with the case. They did let him off easy after they found the teeth in the jewelry box. Annie's fingerprints were found all over the box. After everything else, I wasn't surprised. I pointed Jones and the rest of the department towards Mr. Gardner, hoping they would investigate and uncover any deep, dark secrets I knew that old Fard was hiding. No such luck. The guy was clean as a whistle. No leads. Nothing. Not even the wisp of a smoking gun. Of course, the bastard cried harassment, threatened to sue me and the department, and even managed to put a restraining order on me. All in a day's work, I guess. DNA evidence confirmed that a few of the teeth had come from the trafficked victims we found during the SWAT raid. The others, well, I'm sure the police have their finest people working on it. The department threatened all kinds of consequences if I followed up on either the raid or Annie's murder. It seemed everyone would have rather forgotten about the raid and anything even remotely related. I couldn't help but be angry. Angry at the world, the police department, even Jones. What suddenly looked like a foundation of leads tried up before I even got started. Seeing things that might not even exist. If only. The man seated across from me had no teeth. He said they didn't belong to him, and he ripped them all out. The doctors had to put dentures in just to make sense of anything the guy said. He sat back in silence, beady eyes glaring into my soul. I started tapping my foot impatiently, but the guy kept staring. So, you gonna tell me about Yosabra? He didn't respond. I rubbed my forehead and tried to remember how I got stuck into interviewing this joyous bundle of insanity. After the run-in with that spook on my front lawn, I did everything I could to pick up the trail. Tried to track down witnesses, people who knew Jeff and Annie. It was like hitting a stone wall. Everything turned out to be a dead end. Even my friends in the police department were stonewalling. Jones came by and told me the higher-ups were frowning on this case, frowning being the understatement of the year. Jones may have sat behind a desk now, but even he couldn't change their minds. He said it was weird. He couldn't exactly pinpoint where these orders were coming from. Trying to follow the trail of documents and emails led in circles. Frustrated, I even tried contacting folklorists, anthropologists, mythologists, and anyone else who might know what the hell Yothabra could mean. Most said it was made up bullshit. Others had no clue what I was talking about. One fundamentalist scholar, a real paranoid, the Antichrist is alive and working for the Illuminati right now type, even told me to get myself checked out. As much as I didn't want to admit it, I was stuck. I raged and raged, threw chairs around, even put my foot through my computer monitor. Leads don't just disappear like that. Someone had to be screwing with me. I was still working as a PI when a green-eyed brunette walked into my office a couple of days ago. Her name was Sophia Mason. With pleading eyes and a pouty lip, she asked for help with her husband, Charles. 
And when did he go missing? I pulled out a pencil and notepad, preparing to ask the usual questions. A couple of months ago. Sophia crossed her legs uncomfortably. Have the police gotten involved? Well, Sophia looked away. My husband is at the Riverview Treatment Center. I stopped writing. I thought this was a missing persons case. Charles was missing, but he's been found. She uncrossed her legs. The woman was fidgety. Then what do you need me for? I'm no therapist. I know it might be hard to believe, but Charles asked for you by name. I don't know any Charles Mason. I frowned without realizing. A bunch of questions popped into my head. Who was Charles Mason? Where did he get my name? Ex-cop? As some client I had forgotten about? The scenarios continued to run through my head. I don't know why he said your name, Mr. Barker, but he said you'd very much like to meet him. I simply raised an eyebrow in response. This is getting weird. He said you were looking for... Yasabra. I nearly spit my coffee out. Sophia noticed my surprise. Does that mean anything? I took a deep breath. Leads don't just walk into your office like this one did. It could have been a trick. Someone playing an unfunny prank on me. Someone who really wanted to screw with me. I had to play it calm. Couldn't let anyone know how desperate I was. I cracked my neck, took a deep breath and then narrowed my eyes at Sophia. Look, I don't want to be rude, but you come in and start spouting stuff even trained academics know nothing about, and I'm not supposed to be skeptical. You have a minute to convince me you're not messing around. Sophia's eyes opened wide, and her hands started shaking. She nodded quickly and tried to hide the tears in her eyes. Just hear me out, please. I'll tell you everything I know. I nodded. Charles had gone hiking somewhere in the woods. He hated the office, went outdoors whenever he could. Hiking, backpacking, camping, you name it. It seems to work for him. He was a seasoned outdoorsman and knew his way around nature. That made it all the more surprising when he disappeared for 48 hours near the El Dorado National Forest. Sophia grew worried when he didn't come back and called the police. When the rangers found him, his supplies and clothing were gone, and scars raked his naked body. The rangers attributed them to Charles running through the forest naked. A couple of Charles' teeth were also missing. He kept screaming Yosabra over and over again. They thought it was shock or trauma. When he didn't seem to get better over the next couple of weeks... He wouldn't stop ripping out his teeth. Charles's family has absolutely no history of schizophrenia or any other mental disorders that might cause him to act that way. I don't know what to do. Sophia's voice had a frustrated edge to it. Charles's therapists are simply not helping me. They don't even know what's wrong. About two days ago, Charles mentioned your name. He was screaming it, actually. He said that Yothabra had a message for James Parker. I don't know any James Parkers. I had to write a list of every James Parker I could find in the area and get each one to come see my husband. Sophia was sniffling and didn't even attempt to hide her tears anymore. You seem to know something about Yothabra. That gives me hope. If Sophia was acting, she was doing a damn good job. It still could have been a prank, but I was desperate. Sophia's tears sold it for me. I would have felt bad actually saying no to her. I didn't want to get too hopeful, but the answers seemed close again for the first time in years. I agreed to meet with Charles. So there I was, seated across from Charles Mason, waiting for something. He wasn't hissing at me, so that was a good sign, but he was silent. You gonna tell me about this Yothabra? The guy just kept staring. It was as if he... No. Something behind Charles's eyes was studying me. 
A chill spread through my chest. Just as things were getting uncomfortably awkward, Charles spoke. You came. I had to act calm and uninterested. I didn't want to get carried away. I leaned back in my chair. I was told you asked for my help. Stop wasting my time. Charles licked his lips without smiling. He didn't look away for a second. You're him. Him? The one who's proved himself worthy. Worthy. There was that word again. Is Yotha brother God you worship? Charles spat onto the floor. God, do not provoke me to even attempt to describe the glory that is Yothobra. It would be easier to stuff the stars of the night into a child's pocket. I couldn't help but rub my forehead again. I wanted answers, but vague, incomprehensible bullshit like this did nothing for me. I decided to up the ante. Start making some sense before I start thinking this visit is a waste of time. I made a show of wanting to get up from my chair. Charles looked away, but I still caught his eyes growing wide. His hands jerked as he looked around the room for help. It looked like I found my button. Do not leave, I beg you. He grabbed my hand. Yosebra does not want you to leave. Yosebra wants you to know. I pulled my hand away from Charles. At know what? To know Yothobra. Great. We were going in circles. I stood up as if to leave. I don't have time for culty bullshit. You get one more chance. Who or what the hell is Yothobra? Charles began quaking with terror. Forgive me. I cannot explain Yothobra. Yothobra is but our purpose in life. Our? All of us. Yothobra is our purpose. I sighed. This was still too vague, but we were making progress. I sat back down. Just tell me what you want, or what he wants. There is no he. There is only Yothobra. And Yothobra wants you to gaze upon Yothobra's eternal and terrible beauty. It is my duty to give you instructions. For you are worthy. I am not. I narrowed my eyes. I asked for a pen and some paper, but couldn't get any. They were afraid Charles might stab himself or something. The doctor in charge told me they were recording the conversation and could give me a transcript after the visit. I turned back to Charles who began reciting directions, almost by rote. It was as if these directions were a part of him, like it was his life's purpose to give me these directions. Once he finished with the directions, Charles collapsed into his chair. He took deep breaths and looked worn out. He looked up at me and furrowed his brow. Who are you? He looked visibly confused. Charles looked past me and spotted his wife peeking through the glass. Sophia, what the hell is going on? Charles began standing up now, worried about his surroundings. Charles seemed to be himself again. With the interview over and Charles seemingly healed, Sophia thanked me over and over again. Apparently... It seemed as if whatever fog or insanity Charles had was gone. He was still missing his teeth, but he never seemed to notice. He didn't even remember what happened. His last memory was leaving for his trip. I left Riverview with the printed instructions in my hand and giddy with anticipation. It seemed as if concrete answers were right around the corner. My curiosity... The end of all my searching these past years was within reach. All I had to do was follow these directions through some wilderness. The directions themselves seemed clear enough, if not very specific and a bit weird. Follow the path, stay on the path, pat yourself a couple of times in certain locations, and say Yothobra. Easy enough. 
Of course, I wouldn't be going in empty-handed. I was ex-SWAT. Keep your friends close, keep your guns closer. I wasn't going alone, either. Jones wasn't exactly thrilled about my decision. So let me get this straight. You're going to follow these crazy directions into the woods. Jones looked at the transcript of my conversation with Charles. Directions written by some crazy-ass mental patient, all because there are some faint connections to a possible cult. And, of course, this cult just might practice some kind of human sacrifice. A few days later, we were sitting in my living room. I invited Jones on this expedition as a courtesy. Well, I wasn't planning on going alone. I smirked. What do you think you'll find? Answers. Jones closed his eyes and pinched the bridge of his nose. What the hell are answers going to do for you? I paused, mouth slightly open. I never thought about what I would do after I got answers. I guess I'll finally be able to move on. It's been almost six years since I shot that spook on my front lawn and uh, ten years since that shit show of a raid. That's how long I've been looking for this thing, Jones. I can't give up. Not when I'm this close. Jones nodded, which gave me hope. Look, man, I can really use the backup. Jones stared right into my eyes for a long time before saying anything. I'm bringing my own guns. A week later, we were standing somewhere deep in the Stanislaw National Forest, with high peaks looking down on us from a distance. Charles' directions were clear. We had to begin the hike at 3.34pm. If I was going to use energy to take a hike based on some madman's directions, I might as well get it right the first time. We arrived about half an hour before the appointed time and checked our weapons. Jones brought his trusty scar. Still don't know how his wife was okay with him spending so much money on that. I hoped to keep things at a distance, and opted for an Armalite AR-30 sniper rifle with 338 Lapau ammunition for accuracy. Both of us made sure to carry Beretta 92s as well. Jones even convinced me to bring night vision goggles just in case we'd have to spend the night. Preparation is everything. I looked over the directions. Directions say we start at this small trail over there and continue until we see a dolmen on the left. I didn't know there were any dolmens in this area. Jones's narrowed eyes told me everything I needed to know about his suspicions. Well, if we don't find one, we get to make a premature getaway. Maybe grab a scotch somewhere. The two of us began walking down the trail in silence. Walking through a forest without making noise is much harder than you'd think. Jones and I managed. For about an hour, we hiked through white bark and sugar pines and heard nothing but the singing of birds and wind. Deeper into the forest, we eventually came to a clearing. Sure enough, there was a small dolmen to the left of the trail. Three small, grey, sphere-like stones jutted out from the ground. The chipped capstone was resting lazily on top. I walked up to one side of the dolmen while Jones took the other. From a distance, there wasn't much to see, but up close I could make out carvings or tunes etched into the support stones. Parker, take a look at this. Jones didn't sound too happy. I walked over to the side he was pointing at. Carved into the support stone facing away from the trail was a symbol I was already acquainted with. Maybe Charles was onto something. I ran my fingers over the carvings. That's what bothers me. Jones pulled out his Beretta and began scanning our surroundings more intently as we walked. We kept following Charles' directions for another two hours. We passed more sugar pines, Douglas firs, more dolmens. These dolmens had more carvings on them. The sunlight began getting faint as a fog filtered through the trees. The singing of birds was replaced by the chirping of crickets. A few minutes later, it was completely dark. Have you ever been out in true darkness out in the middle of a forest? Out there, it takes on a life of its own. It envelops you in a suffocating embrace. Good thing Jones convinced me to take the night vision goggles. We strapped ourselves in and continued through the forest. 
The stars were out in full bloom by now. At least they should have been. We couldn't even see the moon. It should have been waxing gibbous this time of the month. I checked my watch. 2200 hours. Jones poked me in the ribs. You feel like we're in someone's crosshairs? He whispered. I nodded. I was getting the same feeling I had under the mansion in Hallbrook and when I walked up to Jeff and Annie's house. Jones jabbed his gun forward, pointing at something. Parker, there's more of them. Through the green haze of my night vision goggles, I noticed stick formations. Lots of sticks tied together or carved to form those vertical football symbols. That's when I noticed the lack of crickets chirping. My gut told me we were close. Jones kept things to a whisper. So, what do you have planned? You just going to spy on whatever little powwow these guys got? That was pretty much spot on. I nodded and continued to walk. Jones followed without another word. As we followed the trail, we began hearing what sounded like whoopings and hollerings and chanting. The glow of orange light materialized in the distance. It got brighter the closer we got until we could see clearly enough to take off our goggles. Both Jones and I fell to our stomachs and began crawling. We didn't want to get spotted by any guards that might have been posted. We stopped when we came to the edge of the forest and looked down into a valley. At the bottom, about 200 figures danced and writhed against the soft glow of about 400 candles, though I felt like there had to be another light source coming from somewhere. The figures danced before a dais carved from black stone. A dais carved from black stone stood behind the gathering. Above the dais towered a cliff face, black as the abyss and nearly as tall as a skyscraper. Jones and I had to crane our necks to see the top of the cliff. Yet that wasn't what shot me full of wonder and fear. Carved from the top to the bottom of the cliff face was one giant and very familiar symbol. I had no idea how that symbol could have been carved. At that size, the entire thing looked monstrous. I suddenly felt completely and utterly insignificant. Was this how ants felt next to a redwood? The chanting echoing throughout the valley shook me out of my reverie. The vast majority of the people wore nothing as they danced in the candlelight. Jones poked me in the ribs. Hand me your binoculars. Jones' voice was barely above a whisper. Damn, they always got hot naked cultist women in the movies, but here, shit. He shoved the binoculars at me. Look. With the binoculars in hand, I scanned the area near to where Jones was pointing. An older man stood near the black stone dais leading the crowd. Of course. Neighborhood watch my fucking ass. I turned to Jones. I thought the department investigated Gardner thoroughly. Jones sat there on his stomach, frowning. I don't think he could believe what he was seeing either. Yeah, me too. Jones was breathing quickly. He was really rattled. We lay there at the edge of the forest on top of the small hill, watching as the chants and hollers crescendoed. Just when I thought it couldn't get any louder, Gardner raised his hands and the crowd calmed. He began to speak. The acoustics of the place seemed suited for this sort of thing, as it carried Gardner's voice all the way to our ears. Gardner told those present that they were worthy, unlike the others who were unworthy to gaze upon and serve Yothobra. So these were the chosen ones, the ones that managed to worm their way through the ranks, the ones who didn't have their teeth ripped out and sacrificed like animals on some altar. I handed the binoculars back to Jones. Here, spot me. Jones gave me a questioning look, but didn't say anything. I pulled the prepared AR-30 and looked down the scope at Gardner. Now I could observe Gardner and be prepared if things got dicey. Gardner seemed to talk more with his arms. They swung wildly as he shouted at the crowd about their worthiness. 
the purpose of humanity was to be worthy of Yothabra. Uh, tonight, on this most auspicious of nights, we have one with us, whose worth has been tested for years, years of searching, yet this one has not given up. He is here among us. At that moment, Gardner turned his head and looked in my exact direction, as did the entire crowd of cultists. About four hundred heads turned into our direction, and eight hundred eyes zeroed in on Jones and me. I swallowed and steadied the rifle. Shit, Jones whispered. He's got magic powers, too. Gardner made no attempt to move. Neither did the rest of the cultists. They just stared. Gardner continued. I present to you the one who is worthy of Yothobra. This worthy one shall show you the glory and beauty of Yothobra. So it was Gardner who was in charge. Was he directly overseeing the trafficking of humans as well? Was he the head honcho? I thought of those people who had been butchered like animals. I thought of Hernandez, of his wife, Rosa, staring ahead in silence, Annie's murder and Jeff's bewilderment. I also remembered the way this high and mighty sack of shit acted when I tried to investigate Jeff and Annie's house. Fuck this guy. I pulled the trigger. I'm not sure what I expected. I wasn't expecting to hit Gardner, much less kill him. The rifle cracked like thunder. In an instant, a shower of blood and organs exploded out of Gardner's back. It looked like I had aimed lower than I wanted, but the bullet had ripped through Gardner's gut. Gardner collapsed to the stone floor, howling in pain. Blood and organs lay splattered across the dais behind him. That's going to leave a mark, Jones snickered. A gut shot can be an extremely painful way to go. Get shot in the aorta or inferior vena cava, you bleed to death in minutes. Get shot in the stomach, though, and the stomach acid or intestinal bacteria end up contaminating the peritoneum, the lining between your abdominal organs. This leads to peritonitis, a serious infection that will paralyze you with pain and make you vomit like there's no tomorrow before finally killing you. If anyone deserved that, Gardner did. Gardner continued screaming in agony as the dark pool of blood under him continued to grow. The cultists froze, unsure of what came next. They weren't fighters, just ordinary people caught up in something bigger and more horrible than they realized. Their worship ceremony was not going as planned, and they froze, deer caught in the headlights. Jones looked at me and wondered if we should start hightailing it out of there. Just as I was going to answer, I heard a noise, a deep droning that rumbled and made the ground buckle underneath me. The droning got louder and became the sound of mountain grinding against mountain. This apocalyptic bellowing easily drowned out Gardner's screeching. At the center of the football symbol, a dot somehow darker than the surrounding stone, appeared and began to expand rapidly. Within seconds, the entire cliffside was devoured into a vast pit leading to the darkest of abysses. The three triangles were untouched and looked like horizontal stalactites on both sides. No, not stalactites. Teeth. I wanted to throw my head back and laugh. It wasn't a vertical football. I was staring into a maw the size of a city block. With the cliffside no longer dampening the grinding noise, the grinding became a cacophony of monstrous howls that coalesced into one mind-shattering roar. It was as if the earth itself was shrieking in agonizing ecstasy. Nobody moved. All were mesmerized by the gaping maw of madness. A long, sinewy, flashy limb, the size of a small tree trunk, snapped out of the abyss, piercing Gardner from the back. 
His chest erupted into thousands of tiny filaments that wrapped around Gardner like barbed wire. It all happened so fast. Gardner looked up, screaming. His skin shriveled up like dried, bloody paper. And then he was snatched back into the abyssal maw without a sound. Jones, eyes wide with terror, began blasting away with his scar and screaming incoherently. More fleshy limbs snapped out, each impaling another cultist. One stuck a woman right through the head. The tiny filaments burst through her head. Her legs and arms flailed like a rag doll as she was also snapped back into the abyss. Another man had his leg ripped off as he was running away and thought he had escaped. Before another limb pierced his torso, wrapped itself around his entire body, and dragged him in, shrieking and wriggling. A younger guy had enough wherewithal to grab and throw an older woman behind him as he ran away. That did him no good. Both were impaled and thrown back into the cavernous mouth. There were still others who actually ran towards the cacophonious abyss as if begging to be swallowed. The leviathan maw seemed only too happy to take them all. It didn't pick favorites. There was movement out of the corner of my eye. Jones had stopped shooting and was running down the hill toward the cliffside and down the path leading to the gaping hole. I cried after him, but I doubt he even heard me. As Jones neared the hole, he too was impaled, enveloped in filaments and devoured. Frozen in terror, the awe and terrible beauty of the scene both repelled and mesmerized me. My body wanted to scream, but I could only manage a few choking gasps. And before I realized it, it was done. The thing had devoured everyone, and the cliffside hardened back into black stone. That was when my body gave up, and I screamed until my throat went raw. A single word crashed through my consciousness. Yothobra. When I awoke, I found myself face down in the grass about twenty feet from where the cultists were devoured. I stood up on wobbly legs as I walked towards the dais. I wanted to convince myself that everything had been one long nightmare, that none of this was real. A book, or more accurately, tome, bound in leather, lay on the dais near where Gardner fell after I shot him. The cover was stained with blood, and the lock already undone. I hoped this would provide the final link in a chain stretching ten years. I flipped open the book in anticipation. The entire book was written in a script I didn't recognize. I flipped a few more pages until I came to a drawing of a colored sphere. There were arrows running from various words on the page to different parts of the sphere. There, in a language I couldn't recognize, were certain characters that seemed to merge and shift right before my eyes into a familiar word. Yothobra. I flipped the page and held my breath, a drawing of what looked like the cliffside just behind me. This drawing, too, showed what looked like a giant mouth carved into the cliffside, with long, sinewy limbs sticking out. There were eleven more pages, each detailing a similar scene. I didn't see the word Yothobra on any of these pages. That's when it hit me. I flipped back to the drawing of the sphere and began noticing familiar patterns on the sphere. This cavernous abyss I had just witnessed swallowing people was not Yothobra. If this drawing was an indication, the entire earth was Yothobra. And we were. Yothobra is our purpose in life. Charles had told me. I dropped the book and ran, laughing maniacally. I didn't know how long I ran for before finally collapsing into blackness. I awoke in the hospital, with a cop next to me. I tried to scream, but it felt like acid had been poured down my throat. I recognized the cop. Hayes. He told me I was found in the forest, naked and screaming incoherently. I asked about Jones. 
Hayes flashed me an angry look. My brain conjured an image of Jones running toward the abyss. As I lay there on the hospital bed, Hayes read me my rights. They never managed to pin anything on me. Given the absence of a body and the insane mess I was found in, the DA didn't think she could convince a jury that I killed Jones. I was set free. That was a month ago. I tried pulling the pieces of my life back together again. I chalked up the experience to a bad case of hallucination and convinced myself the leather-bound tome was nothing but bullshit. Convincing bullshit, but bullshit nonetheless. It seemed to work, until a few days ago. I found myself in my office and had my desk drawer open. Underneath some papers, I found that ancient leather-bound book. The sights of the book threw me in a panic. Since then, I've tried everything. I've burned it, shredded it, and even burned it page by page. It always manages to find its way back into my desk. Just two days ago, I mailed the damn thing off to Australia. It came back in the mail yesterday. Every time I see the book, more words shift and coalesce into familiar letters arranged in familiar words. And now I finally get it. Everything was connected. The anonymous tipper, the paper trails that led in a circle, the dead ends, the coincidences. It's all part of the grand design. Yosobro wants me. That's why Gardner spoke of testing. That's all the last ten years were. A fucking test. Gardner's devouring was just the passing of the torch. A tiny part of me wants to give up and embrace everything. Let go of the burden of refusal. Submit and absolve myself of everything. So far, I've refused. No way in hell am I going to be the next gardener. I know I'll refuse tomorrow, too, and the day after, but a year from now? I don't know. Five years? <laughs> I took out my last Beretta today. I can't deny the temptation. There's a good chance I'll use it by the end of the week if I don't give myself over. I took another look at the leather-bound tome this morning. The script covering the first page merged into a single phrase. You are worthy.